Welcome and thank you for attending the Finance Committee meeting today. My name is Zahira Naz, I am the Chair of the Finance Committee. The meeting today is open to the public, however, part two of the report at item seven on the agenda is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information related to financial and business affairs. If members wish to discuss the information in this document, we will need to ask the members of the public and press to kindly leave for that part of the meeting and will pause the webcast. The meeting will be webcast and the recording will be available for people to view later through the Council's website. It is also possible that the Sheffield Live TV will record and rebroadcast this meeting. We have received no questions from the public. Please can I request that all mobile phones and other such equipment are switched to silent as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test planned for today. If there's an emergency evacuation, please take instructions from the town hall staff. The assembly point is at Tudor Square. For the benefit of the webcast, I will ask finance committee members in turn to introduce themselves. And I'll start with um, Mary Lee, and we'll come back to you, Marianne. <laughs> I'm Councillor Mary Lee um, from Donald Ward. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Councillor Ibiola, Councillor for Netherridge and Sharon. Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Mike Chaplin, representing Southie Ward. Marianne Elliott, Green Councillor for Gleadless Valley. Thank you. Hi, I'm Phyllis Chapman. I'm a councillor for Mosborough Ward. Shafat Mohammed Ecclesall. Mike Lindsay, councillor for West Ecclesfield and Vice Chair of the Committee. Thank you, everyone. Is there any apologies for absence? Toby Madison. No, sir, Chair. Thank you. Item two, exclusions of the press and uh, public and press. As above, part two of the report at item seven on the agenda is not available to the public or press because it contains exempt information. Item three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare an interest in any items of business on the agenda today? No. Item four, minutes of the previous meeting on page 11 of your pack. Can I ask members to approve as a correct record the minutes of the meeting for the finance subcommittee held on 22nd March 2023 and the finance committee held on 17th of May 2023. Are we agreed? Yeah, thank you. Also, um, we, uh, we need to seek approval as a matter of arising from the meeting on 17th May for the additional appointment to the Finance Urgency Subcommittee for Councillor Mary Lee. Are we agreed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. And can we also agree the appointment Delegation to the monitoring officer, David Hollis, in consultation with the relevant political group whip in respect of the appointment of members to a subcommittee. Are we all agreed? Yeah, thank you very much. Item five, um, is there any public questions or petitions? None, Chair. Thank you very much. Item six, work program. This is on page 25 of the, of the agenda pack. Um, and I'll pass it on to Craig Rogerson, who's going to introduce this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, previously, the work program for finance subcommittee was part of the SNR work program. Now that this is its own committee, we now have a, a standalone work program for finance committee. That's attached at page 25 of your pack. Uh, members are asked to approve the updated work program, including the additions and amendments which are set out on page 28. 
Thank you very much for that, Craig. Um, item number seven, page 43 of the agenda, decisions taken under urgency provisions to receive reports of any decisions taken under the urgency provisions since the last meeting of the committee. This item is for noting only. Tommy Whittaker is here um, to answer any questions. Councillor Chaplin. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I see that the, the date for the auction was the 17th of May. So we're now looking at this in hindsight. Um, can you explain how that works, <laughs> please, Tony? Yeah, I can. Um, so we found out about this auction um, a week before it came to auction. Um, and because of the, the timing of the election, it wasn't possible after consulting with um, David Hollis to organise an urgency subcommittee. So the decision was taken to bid at auction through the urgency provisions. Um, we did bid at auction and we weren't successful, um, but the decision was uh, to allow us, to, to enable us to bid at auction. Thank you, Tommy. Can I bring you in, David? Yeah, just for a bit of clarity, uh, we can only call an urgency subcommittee on five clear days' notice. There is no legal provision to call it on less than that. So there wasn't time to actually call an urgency subcommittee meeting before the auction, and that's why in consultation with the chair, we decided that it was appropriate to use the urgency decision-making provisions. I may come back in depending upon what Mike wants to bring up. Thank you, Councillor Levery. Thank you, Chair. Um, is it usual for such short notice on items that go to auction? It's, uh, it's usually a number of weeks. Yeah. It, it can be a number of weeks, and we usually uh, have a number of weeks. On this occasion, we didn't. It was just brought to auction very quickly. Um, we were only made aware of it one week before the auction. Thank you. Um, in terms of the paper, my, I have a number of questions on it, which I'd like some clarification, if that's possible, please. So, in terms of property acquisition and, and bidding for um, properties, particularly in the city centre, um, what is the policy around determining what we should bid for, what we shouldn't bid for, and what's the overall objective? So this, in, this particular acquisition was part of the Future High Streets Fund um, proposition and the Get Building Fund. So in that original submission was a recognition that the council owned very little property on Fargate. In fact, owned no property on Fargate at the time of the bid. Um, and it was a response to... Um, post-COVID, when we were trying to reactivate Fargate. So within the Future High Streets Fund and within the Get Building Fund were two strands for property acquisitions, um, and a number of target buildings were identified in both of those for us to acquire. The first of those acquisitions was Event Central, um, which is the building adjacent to this building. Um, and therefore, what we're looking at doing is creating a critical mass to reactivate the high street. At the moment, Fargate is in a number of private ownerships, and there are a number of landlord and tenant issues, we aren't able to influence that um, because we have a limited control over property. So here this was seen as an opportunity to acquire further foothold on Fargate to start to try and steer the use of those. Um, there is a future high street fund bid which um, is in the public domain I'm happy to share and also the strategy that sets out why the acquisitions are important within that. So with this particular one, what would it be used for? What would be the plan with it? So the intention um, with this particular property was to activate the street through some meanwhile use. So um, we've had successful uh, initiatives in the past where we've got meanwhile use in there. What we would be looking to do would be to sort of test. Um, at, the, at the time of the acquisition, it had a, it's got a lease, so it's got an existing lease in. That lease would have terminated, um, potentially breaks, I think it was in 2025. So at that point, we could have chosen to either relet that property once Fargate had been regenerated or to sell at that point. Mike, do you have any further questions? So I had a question about Brownfield Acquisitions Budget because you mentioned this in, and um, how are they how many acquisitions have been funded by Get, Get Building Fund and, and the Future High Street Funding Grant in the past? 
So there's only one acquisition being funded through the Future High Street Fund budget, and that's Event Central. Um, we have bid on a number of other properties and haven't been successful. But the Brownfield Housing Fund, um, well, the Brownfield Acquisitions Fund, which is a separate council, internal council uh, fund, with there have been five acquisitions to date. Okay, the, the last the last bit, and, and this is the bit I'm a bit concerned about, is that bidding blind on a property without having uh, any understanding of any capital investment requirements. So I'm not aware of it. Uh, how are we going to uh, deal with that? Should we bid, we bid in the future blind, or are we not going to bid blind in the future? So we always try not to bid blind. Um, we did undertake a, uh, we did walk round, so we walked round with um, technical team, professional advisors from our own internal in-house team, a building surveyor and a surveyor from my team went round and had a look at the property and looked at the legal pack with uh, legal input. So we had some knowledge. What we haven't been able to do is undertake a full condition survey, which is what we would normally do. Um, the reason for that was we just didn't, simply didn't have time in the week that we had. Normally, um, we would undertake a condition survey uh, so that we're fully in, in uh, we fully understand the, the issues. That initial inspection revealed a few issues, but because the building was tenanted uh, and had a relative, a few years left on the lease, we had an income against that property to offset any additional capital costs. Um, the capital costs, um, the, main, the main issues was, that the main um, outcome of that initial inspection was that there was no immediate capital investment required should we acquire that property. It would be a choice that we could make at a later date. Okay, so um, in follow-up, we have discussed this in, in governance as well because I think that the spokespersons should at least be informed so that we can have a, a talk to the officers before something goes to auction of this nature to ask these very questions so that we understand what the uh, risk is for the council and what the issues are. So I'm hoping in the future that, that this is what will happen. Okay, but thanks, that's the only questions. Yes, that's right. It was discussed at Governance Committee and we are going to put it into the Constitution that where time permits, because sometimes it may not, but where time permits, the discussion should also be with the group spokespeople and the Deputy Chair, as well as the Chair, before the urgency decisions are used. That's not just property, that's on any use of the urgency provision. Thank you, I, I agree with that. Um, Councillor Levery and David. Um, tell me, can I just ask, can we organise a briefing for the Future High Street Fund for this committee? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'm quite happy to organise that and also I'll walk round so you can see the work that's underway and the proposed plans. That'll be fantastic. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions? Councillor Elliott? Thank you. Just a minor point. There might be something I've missed, but the report we've got is the advice to delegate the decision making to officers. But have we actually got the report of the the decision, the decision that officers made to decide to bid for it, and the, you know, perhaps the limit they were going to put on it? Because I see it went for slightly over the asking price, which is probably why we didn't get it. But did that sort of second bit follow, or not? I'm not sure I quite understand your question. So we, the, the decision was whether to bid at auction and the value that we would bid at. So that's the decision that you've got in front of you. So we bid at auction. We weren't successful. So is there, is there another bit of the decision you were expecting? Sorry. I'm... No, sorry. Maybe I've just misinterpreted it. But this looks like um, just a report to delegate the decision making to officers rather than the substantive decision itself. Is that not the case? Part of what the decision will be about. It should have been a decision to acquire, which will have been subject to being successful at auction rather than a, a delegation. The delegation is to officers under the urgency provisions. So that it, it doesn't need a specific delegation to officers because the urgency provisions delegate it to officers. Councillor Livery? Yeah, just to follow up on the future I street fund presentation, if we can have a, a, a full idea of what properties we are going to bid on the High Street project, please, that would be helpful. 
at the moment, no more. Like, it's the honest answer to that. Um, but uh, we'll take you on a we'll take you on a tour, and we'll show you exactly which, you know, how the future high street fund has rolled out, um, and because uh, the, the original uh, project was put together some time ago now. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, there's no further questions for you, Tammy. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number eight, which is on page 55 of the agenda. And the presenting officer is Jane. Jane Willoughby. Over to you. Thank you. Chair, if I might just do a brief introduction and, and Jane will take you through some more of the detail. Um, so the report in front of you is the council's outturn position in relation to 22-23. And I'm pleased to say that there was significant in-year progress from the sort of high exposure which we anticipated at month five position of over 20 million to a position of uh, five million pounds overspent in a year after taking into account um, proposed uh, carry forwards as set out in the, um, in the report before you. So uh, there was significant progress due to um, officers taking proactive action in relation to mitigate the in-year spends and we're able to see that the benefits from that. Um, this report has a sister report in a sense which is the council's accounts. I'm pleased to say in line with the regulations I was able to sign the draft accounts on the 31st of May. Um, they are now out to public inspection and they will be considered uh, next week at the audit committee's uh, meeting which will have been the first meeting which they've had in the new municipal year. So just that bit of introduction, um, Chair, and, and just to say thank you to the team for getting those accounts um, out and in such good shape, given the amount of work that's taken. Um, what members probably won't realise is that that was a two-month reduction in relation to the time period based on the regulations for the current year, which shows um, the, uh, the dedication and the work which the staff have undertaken. So I'd like to... Thank them for it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Tony. Um, so the purpose of the report is to bring the council up to date with the um, general fund outturn position for the full year for 22-23, and the HRA, the capital outturn, and um, also the treasury management outturn position. So as Tony said, the 22-23 general fund overspent by 5 million against a net budget of 450, which meant an unplanned draw from reserves in the year to meet the deficit. In 21-22, we'd identified a 70 million uh, general fund reserve, which we were able to draw on to manage the risk associated with the delivery of our budgets and savings plans. We used 20 million in 21-22 to manage the overspend, and we used 15 when we set the budget in 22-23. So the draw from the reserve this year is really more like 20 million. So this leaves us 30 million um, left in that risk reserve as we move into 23-24 budget delivery. So the closing position did improve significantly throughout the year from the starting um, of over 20 million, as Tony said, during the first part of the year down to just 5 million at the end. Um, the table on page 59 shows um, the improvement each month and which committees contributed towards that improvement. So the Adult Social Care Committee uh, reduced their overspend by 6 million, and that was mainly due to the uh, winter discharge funding, um, which was announced in uh, November 22. And the Transport, Regen and Climate Committee reduced their overspend by 2.5 million, um, and that was partly due to the mitigation of an unachievable saving within that budget. The Strategy and Resources Committee benefited from uh, additional income from investments and slippage in the capital programme meant that the, um, the overall budget was uh, underspent slightly, plus some additional income from the business rate levy surplus. So the main reasons for the overspend were the shortfalls in each of the implementation plans. The budget implementation plans, uh, 19.5 million were shown as not delivered as we closed the year. One-off mitigations of 6.5 million offset some of those delivery challenges um, and the inflationary impact that we saw in 22-23. On page 60, um, it acknowledges the year-on-year -year uplift that we saw in energy prices that we'd had to cover within the year. So we'd seen over 100% increase in costs across the council, resulting in an additional five million pounds on our energy bills in year, which we covered from drawing down from provisions that we prudently accounted for in previous periods. So um, 
as we said, in the strategy and resources committee, so moving on to each of the committees in general, strategy and resources, there was lots of challenges in BIP, uh, the delivery of the BIP budget implementation plans, um, lots to do with operating model efficiencies. Um, we also had some upsides in terms of that income that we saw from the business rate, levy surplus, and interest income coming in. Um, we, in adult social care, the main challenges, as we've talked about throughout the year, have been the challenge in delivering those savings proposals. So they had a target of over 25 million to deliver in a year, and they were reporting to deliver 16.5 towards the end of the year. So the main issues were in the purchasing budgets, um, where the committees are, um, uh, that are going to note the, um, the service intends to respond to these challenges by continuing reviewing the high cost packages of care, um, to understand those cost drivers and, and looking at the um, value for money within the services and also looking at how we can shape the market to increase options for day services, respite and accommodation. The older people's budgets have seemed to stabilise towards the last part of the year with better trends in new cost of home care packages which seem at a more sustainable level. The upside was the improvement that we had due to the winter discharge funding in autumn 22. Um, education, children and families, the challenges again were in the delivery of the savings plans. A lot of that was in the children's residential uh, strategy savings and also a shortfall um, from the contributions from health that we'd anticipated within the year. Issues in placement costs were also quite a big contributor to the overspend. In the housing committee, um, the housing revenue account was 12 million sp overspent against the budget, which represented a reduction to the uh, capital programme in year. The majority of that overspend was due to um, loss of rents due to vacant properties, disrepair claims, um, and a repairs and maintenance budget of over 10 million over budget, which increased towards the latter end of the year. Uh, finance have been working with the service to understand the reasons for the overspend, but this is largely due to addressing the backlog of issues um, to do with compliance issues in gas safety and a significant amount of large repairs due to the condition of our stock. We have seen a turnaround in compliance rates though, uh, from you know, up to 98% from 87, and we've seen turnaround time in repairs reduced significantly throughout the year. Um, we've got underspend in transport regen and climate. Um, some of that was to do with the clean air zone budget saving implementation that was covered through one-off use of reserves. We did have some challenges in planning income, but some upside in our highways network management income. In economic skills and development, we were 400k underspent. Um, lots of that was due to staffing forecasts. In this committee, we see lots of external funding and the committee has um, the challenge of, and opportunity, I suppose, due to the nature of the grants that fund the, um, the, the staffing in some of that area. The waste and street scene was 300K under, which was a really good position given the, um, the size of the expenditure budget within that committee. Um, and the big challenges that this year have been really to do with the contract inflation. And it's worth noting that the inflation is 12.6% on some of those major contracts this year, which is a huge amount to deal with. Um, community parks and ledger was 1.6 million underspent, and the majority of that was uh, an underspend in youth due to a delay in the restructure in that area. So there's been some uh, one-offs in these committee budgets. So we've got some underspend that's been carried forward already um, in line with approved spending plans for the paid hall project. And there's some further carry forwards in underspend of base budgets that are detailed in section 1.5. So the first one is the local area committees. So this, this is for the committee to approve these carry forwards for the budgets. So the outturn position assumes that this has already been happened. So the 5 million position assumes that these have been agreed by, uh, by committee today. So the first one is for the local area committees. So there's been a slippage in the program um, and that is due to be spent in line with the approved plans that were approved at the beginning of the year. Um, and that's 239,000. The team around the person, that's another part of the community's budgets. Um, this was 259,000. This is was sort of displaced general fund um, as a result of additional grant that we were able to lever in the year. There was 200,000 for youth um, in the voluntary sector grants area so we had an underspend in that area and we would like to carry that forward to 
uh, make sure we apply to the voluntary sector within the year. And there was also a 300k um, in housing general fund for reg uh, legislation, regulation. The capital programme outturn in Appendix 1 sets out the overall position about how we del delivered against our 22-23 budget, which Damien will just give you a brief overview in just a second. And the second appendix is the Treasury Management Outturn position, which is our annual review of the Treasury Management activities and the actual credential Treasury indicators. The strategy was set for 22-23 prior to the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, so expectations for the bank rate were fairly low, which jumped towards the end of 22-23 as it reached 4.25%. Our investment income jumped significantly and the average rate of return uh, we'd forecast 0.3%, but our actual returns were more like 1.85%. Slippage in the capital programme also impacted on our capital financing requirement, which was less than it was expected. There's also lots of interesting information in relation to the external economic market context and the impact on interest rates in the appendices. So that meant that we had to be very proactive with our investments in the year and emphasise the need to maintain close knowledge of our cash flow. Um, I think that's all that I've got to talk about at the moment. So I will just pass to Damien to give a few highlights on the capital outturn. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the capital budget is, is more of a dynamic one that moves in during the year as we get in more funding and schemes come forward for approval. So in that way, it differs from the, um, from, from the revenue budget and it's sort of like a snapshot in time as you have projects that will span multiple financial years. Um, it's also been delivered in a very challenging context, uh, which has seen the you know, impact of ongoing inflation, the war in Ukraine, which has caused supply chain issues, there's been labour market issues, skill shortages, and actually just still that release of pent-up demand from COVID. So there's been a lot of people trying to access capital um, developments um, across the country. Um, and it's in that context where we've seen high tender returns coming back, where schemes have had to be value engineered back down, we've had to seek additional funding, and that slowed the delivery of schemes um, as well. So it's yeah, it's in that context that we start probably that we start with a budget of over 300 million in capital, which was down to around 240 by the time we got to the end of the year, and that was work that we did with project managers, challenging around what what could we actually deliver in year. So those variations were brought through the finance sub and strategy and resources part of the monthly approvals um, each month. So against that budget that um, was at 240 million at month 12, we, we delivered 190 million pounds of capital investment in the year, uh, which was up from 151 million last year. So actually we are seeing, you know, it's starting to, starting to ease from COVID. We are building up, that's quite, you know, quite a good set, a set of delivery that we've managed to improve on last year. Um, largest spend areas were in, um, Transport region and climate change at 84 million, uh, where that's uh, got the um, heart of the city program in, which is taking up uh, the majority of the spend in that area. And then housing uh, was uh, spending 57 million, uh, a lot of that reflecting the stock increase program that's in train and also the increasing investment in uh, updating our existing stocks, such as the electrical upgrade program, etc. Although in year we did see, and this is one of the um, slippage items, if you like, uh, the, the how a roofing contractor went into administration. And so we had what would have been expected to be a 12, 13, 14 million pounds on that contract um, spend just stopped and we've had to go out to retender. So there sort of sums up some of the issues uh, that we're facing. Um, there's also been significant investment in this, the education estate. So new uh, special educational needs places as part of the strategy and also um, starting that expansion of school places in the southwest of the city, uh, where we've seen increase in demand. Um, so at the year end, we were roughly, the slippage was 15% uh, of the capital budget, and we, we make a distinction between slippage and reprofiling, which is summarized uh, in the glossary at the back, um, where reprofiling, we say it's, we've got allocations for schemes or schemes that aren't yet in delivery and we take strategic decisions say actually no we're going to move that funding into future years we're going to deliver that later whereas a uh, slippage is we're on the ground and actually things have slowed down so uh, at 15 percent that's that's equivalent to what it was last year uh, and it's it's a reasonable level i think to expect in a in a capital program um funding of the capital program was 
around a third from uh, prudential borrowing, largely on heart of the city. Um, a third came in from grants from either central government or other public bodies, uh, getting a lot, obviously a lot of income from the combined authority now. 25% um, then came from um, the HRA, so that's reflecting the major repairs reserve and the investment into the uh, housing stock. And then so that the remainder was just our, our own capital receipts. Um, but actually the majority of those were towards heart of the city because they were from the income from the sales from uh, the residential at Burgess House. So that's roughly the breakdown of how we, uh, we fund the capital programme. Um, I think it's going to, fair to say, it's going to continue to be challenging um, to deliver uh, a programme again this year uh, for all the reasons we've mentioned. Those tender prices aren't generally showing a, a big downward shift as yet, but we sh will hopefully start to see um, the stocks for each town's fund work move in this year. Uh, the levelling up fund um, work should take off again this year. So we have got, and Heart City should start to come to completion, but these other schemes will be coming on to take place. And you will see those schemes come through on the monthly approvals um, each month. So yeah, just in summary, we'll, um, we've delivered 190 million of investment. We reckon slippage at a 15% is a reasonable level to have come in at, uh, but yeah, it continues to be a challenging market uh, to deliver schemes in. Thank you, Councillor Levery. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the revenue budget, really pleased to see Adult Health and Social Care look like it's coming back into life, which is great, and hopefully education is not far behind. Um, on the capital side, I have a couple of questions. Um, the roofing programme. Is the programme being rebid on the properties that were in it that were in the Averside Centre? Yeah, I think we've got... I can check for you when that's expected back, when that's going, to, that's gone out for. But yeah, it will be to cover the, everything that wasn't yet delivered in that in that original delivery scheme. Okay, thanks, Danny. Because on the follow up on that, um, there was a block of flats in Burn Cross, which um, I have now found out were removed from that original contract because of financial reasons. And I've had them re-inspected and the roof, was, the roof did need replacing. So what other properties have we got which were taken out for financial reasons that need revisiting to make sure they're in the programme? Yeah, I can take that back to the, uh, the uh, investment team in housing. Okay, thanks. And finally, on, on slippage, um, we're down to 21%, but that's still... A significantly high level of slippage. The problem with slippage is that it costs you more because in an inflationary period uh, the prices are going to go up so we can get less for our money. So do we have a target aim in terms of slippage and what ideally we want to get? Obviously we don't want any but what's realistically achievable in the current climate? I think what we've managed to deliver in the current climate is um, a really good effort um, against the, it, it, is a, it is becoming a vicious cycle in that what we've got is grants that um, are give, were given probably early you know, 20, 21, 22 when government decided on the, the value because you know, it takes quite a while often for like Future High Street Fund for example was you know bidding work for that was in 2020 and then the decisions are made and finally you get an award and then by the time you go out to tender with the inflation as it is, you, with a scheme that's not affordable that you originally decided. So then you have to value it down, which takes more time. So again, um, prices are always increasing on this basis. So it is a vicious cycle at the moment. It is very difficult. Um, I think people have been, what we've been trying to do, and I think it's in the, um, the end of the outturn report, is you know building in bigger contingencies uh, into uh, budgets when we're going out to tender. Um, in order to try and you know mitigate that, so that when the prices come back, actually we, we're not having to look for further funding. Um, but again, it's being able to um, justify that to funders when you're going out and saying, "Well, actually, we want a, we want a huge contingency," you know, because that that 
that is difficult. So we will just, I think what we'll just continue to do is try and work with project managers to make sure that we're looking at uh, realistic delivery timeframes um, and encouraging them to, to address those, you know, put those contingencies in um, and do as much of that work up front as we can. I mean, it's like, but you will, we will find, as, as Tammy did, sometimes you get short turnaround decisions of, on funding streams as well. You know, you need to bid, you know, that this bid needs to be in next week and it's all hands to the pump to put the best bid you can in that it slows down. So I suppose I can't really answer your question, but I think this year has been a really good positive effort in terms of, you know, coming to 20 what, 20 percent. But I do intend to try and do a piece of work and, and get in touch with the core cities and see, you know, where, how are they finding it, you know, and see if I can speak to some, peer, some, some more of my peers and just get a bit more of a sense of that. So in terms of the roofing programme, have we rebased the costs based on the fact we've slipped back? They will, I think, I've not seen the outline business case back yet, but I would expect that that's what housing colleagues have done. I'll get those figures. Councillor Shafrak. Thank you, Chair. Um, mine is going to be around page seven. Well, it depends which page it is, but page 70, big page, or page 16 of 27, and basically it is around housing. Um, I mean, if you look at the bottom bit, overspending HRA impact on capital programme, and there's clearly been a big hit there, £12 million, and I think foul sentence you say savings in revenue budgets in 23 24 must be delivered to ensure so what actions will we take if we start to see slippage again because the cost of this has been that you know we've had 2.4 million extra in legal cost i think that's on page 70. 10 million on housing repairs and we've lost 2.8 million this year just on rent and 1.1 as the report talks about in council tax so what actions are we going to have in place to make sure we're not 12 million over again? Because the long-term impact will, of that will be that less the capital programme. So I think the two are interlinked. You're looking at Damien because it's the impact on the capital programme, but ultimately it's the overspend in the revenue account that are creating that sort of issue towards the capital programme. Um, a lot of work has been done this year to understand those base budgets. So um, some of the... Um, pressures have been accounted for, but there are also quite a lot of savings to be delivered. So finance colleagues are working quite closely with housing colleagues to make sure that forecasts are robust and that sort of um, budgets are accurately monitored. Um, yes, we do have, we had issues last year in terms of the dis disrepair claims and the legal co costs associated with disrepair claims. And that was something that emerged throughout the year. Um, and I know that uh, colleagues in housing are taking action to try and make sure that those are dealt with more timely um, in order to reduce and mitigate the impact and the costs that escalate as a result. So there's, there's individual things within the disrepair service, the gas safety. Uh, we've seen a huge amount of investment this year to address the compliance issues. Hopefully next year we'll not see similar overspends in the gas safety um, area. We, di we did have large scale investments in, um, in, in sort of the large repairs in, in housing. So yes, we are hoping that we would see a lower amount going into next year as we sort of monitor budgets more closely. But there is something about getting really close into the detail of those budgets and understanding where those overspends are. So yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in housing in conjunction between, between service and finance so that they can understand what the budgets need, where they are against those budgets. So if we look at it at the moment, the voids, i.e. the empty council properties, we are about, as the report says, 3.4%, nearly twi more than twice where we should be. So if I asked you this question in six months' time, where are we with vo voids? Where would you tell me we would be percentage-wise? I think that would be a question for the Housing Committee, really, and for the... Uh Director of Housing, Janet, and, uh, and also Tom, that would be able to, to answer that. So we'd be able to support with the information and, and help services to understand the budgets better to be able to deliver against them, but in terms of how they're able to turn around that, that void position and fill those properties, um, again, that's, that's with the, the service rather than finance. Uh, I mean, obviously, going on top of it will be the Housing Committee, but I think, Chair, we need to keep a watching brief on this one and maybe come back 
to this say the next quarter or so to just to make sure that housing realise that we are going to be watching this the finance committee because it has consequences you know the roof that Mike speaks about has not got any better has it Mike <laughs> it was inspected five six years ago and now, and now it's taken off the list the roofs don't get improved over time they get worse so that's it that's the cost of what's going on thank you chair um thank you um councillor shafak i i will be emailing janet sharp and asking them questions and i do agree that we do need to keep an eye on that um councillor chapman yes my question is about um, items on page 78 the likes of underspent by two hundred and thirty nine thousand which is almost a quarter of the total budget. Do we know whether this is a problem again across all of them? Can we have a, a breakdown of the spends? Is there one like that's just not spending very much at all and all the others on a par? So there was a temporary budget that, I suppose it was one off budget that was agreed um, in the previous year that was then carried forward into last year. Uh, for all of the lacks, and I think that was around about 800,000, and that was on top of their sort of annual budget allowance amount. So this underspend relates to the carry forward of, of that sort of large amount of budget. There was um, the, the lax um, plans, if you like, I, I, I forget the terminology, the lax are sort of the business case, the service plans for, for what they're going to be delivering were all agreed earlier this year. I think it was around January time. So I think until they were then agreed, it was difficult to make firm commitments because there was obviously a lot of consultation with the with the local areas to make sure that those those plans were exactly what they wanted to deliver. So the slippage was really because they were unable to sort of deploy in line with what they'd said they were going to do. So they are um, all the uh, local area committees are looking to be delivering the plans in line with what they said they're going to do within the plan, uh, which are available online. We can have a look at them in further detail. Councillor Chaplin. Thank, thank you, Chair. I suppose mine's, mine's more of a comment, really, that um, that we're we're starting off this year in in a much much better position than we were this time last year, uh, and I think we should be thanking the officers here um, for for all the hard work that's gone on through the year to to get us to this position. Um, there are a lot of economic forces out there, not least with uh, with inflation and particularly rising um, prices in the construction industry um, that are making it difficult to keep top side of the of the capital budget. Um, no, I think in view of that, really, we um, we should be um, <coughs> we should be accept, accepting and, and welcoming this report at this stage. Um, but there's always space. Um, to monitor and see how we go through the year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Can you explain again the issue about the lack of spend that you, and I don't recognise that, so maybe um, I'm misunderstanding what you, what you said about that. Apologies. I can probably get you a more comprehensive answer. Oh, this is from my understanding, so I do apologise if it's not something that you've recognised. The previous year's budgets, um, there, there was kind of one-off amounts allocated to each of the different local area committees, which were then rolled forward as part of the budget planning process for last year. Um, the, the plans that were agreed with local area committees were all kind of delayed until I think it was January this year, when they were published and sort of agreed at local and in each of the uh, individual forums. And published online so it, it just kind of meant that the plans to deliver uh, the proposals set out in those um, those business cases were delayed um, from that point but they are available online if you want to have a look at the individual lacks but they the budget will be delivered in line with the proposals that, that they've set out early in the year so I'm not sure whether that answers it Mary it, it does somewhat I think what what obviously we did um, a big consultation across the city to see what people's priorities were in their lack areas mm. um, to then start allocating that 100,000 and that was the money that then was um, allocated to whatever projects the lack saw fit during that following on from that big consultation event so I think the delays were about um, the processes we had to go through yeah. and could, going back to housing um, 
it talks about um, 2.4 million underspend in tenant services um, and various in neighbourhood services, um, 1.7 in repairs, 0.6 in fire safety and housing employability. Too. These are services that normally tenants would get, which they are not receiving. And without, if that they were receiving those services, then the overspend would be much worse in housing services. And that's the logic of that, isn't it? So it's um, it, it, we're not we're not congratulating that underspend. We're worried about that underspend because that affects people's lives in this particular, particularly in, in areas where cost of living crisis is really impacting our communities. So I hope this um, are, are those. Are we deliberately keeping those vacancies in order to um, alleviate the, the other, the rest of the overspend? I do agree the point that the underspend there represents um, a lack of staff in that particular area, which is you know not where we'd set the budget at the beginning of the year, which is somewhat mitigating the overspend in housing repairs and maintenance. Um, there was. Um, vacancies that were held and I know there's been a lot of work looking at the operating model in housing um, so there's probably a result of that as we've moved into this year there's been a lot of work about rebasing the budgets and understanding the staffing budgets and where they really need to be set so you know hopefully this year we will see you know more delivery in line with the budgeted level rather than the underspends which I'm not sure whether that is a false position and that is actually where the service needs to be to deliver it it's you know optimum capacity um, capability or whether the budgets you know just needed to be a little bit realigned so hopefully this year after the work that's been done we will see you know better management uh, against budget I suppose um, that then we, we can go back to that when um, you know you're going to write to Janet Sharp and we're going to have a review or we're going to look at this in again in six months time particularly on, on this, this overspend thanks that's fine councillor Lee Thank you very much. I don't think there's any further comments or questions. Um, i also like to thank you and the finance team for all the hard work over the last year. Um, and looking forward to doing all the hard work again this year. <laughs> thank you very much. Moving on to item number nine, capital approvals, um, page 121 on the agenda. And this one, Damien, thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm bringing forward the adjustments to the capital program um, for this month. Um, it's got four elements to it. We've got specific variations to projects that have uh, come through the approvals process this month. Um, we've got the formal ratification of the adjustments that have, have come about as a result of the year-end close-down process, which we've just gone through, so where we've discussed the underspends, overspends, etc., that are in the outturn report, how we've slipped funding into, slipped to delivery into this financial year um, is to approve those. Uh, and also the accepting and making of two grants. Um, so I'll start with the Appendix 1 with what's come through uh, this month. Um, under Transport Regen and Climate Change, we've got feasibility work on several 20 mile an hour zones um, and also a saving on one that's gone into delivery. Um, we've also had a saving on the grant that we were making to uh, the PTE to upgrade the tram stops uh, at a cliff as part of the levelling up fund bid. So uh, that funding will be able to be recycled into the rest of the uh, at a cliff levelling up fund um, pot. Um, communities, parks and leisure, um, we've got uh, 120k going on uh, grants uh, to create accessible toilets at Western Park and Crystal Peak Shopping Centre. Um, and in appendices three and four, you'll get the details of the grant that we're accepting in order to be able to deliver that and the grants that we're going to issue to those organisations uh, to deliver uh, those facilities. Um, at Hollins End Park, we've uh, had some Veolia grant that's been accessed by the friend of groups that we're going to use to um, upgrade the uh, provision of play equipment there. Uh, we've also, we're also having to put in some additional funding on the tennis courts that are being delivered there. Um, needs extra work on the ground um, in order to, uh, to the surfacing of the court needs extra work following surveys that have been done. Um, so there's going to be improvements in that area. Uh, we're doing some feasibility work at Osgathorpe Park to create some new football facilities um, in Burn Grieve. And uh, there's also uh, noting 60k additional cost to deliver the uh, new kiosk uh, as part of the 
active as Park at Parkwood uh, Springs scheme. Um, so that should allow us to, uh, to deliver that element. Um, under housing, with some remedial works needed on a retaining wall at Chesterfield Road, uh, we're just doing the initial feasibility on that um, before re uh, reinstatement works. Uh, there's been a 900k increase in cost on the fire safety works at uh, single staircase tower blocks. Um, this is more or less, I think, what we expected. There were several items that were only in as provisional sums in the original contract, plus as uh, the contract's been on site, uh, additional works have been identified uh, required for fire safety. So some of those costs are still to be negotiated, but we're putting in 900k we think it might come in at less than that, but we, we're just putting those additional uh, uh, budget in now so that we can instruct those works. Um, on uh, Oh yes, we've, we also received uh, increased funding uh, from the local authority housing fund. Uh, this is Homes for Ukraine. So this is allowing us to acquire more properties um, in order to um, house asylum seeking, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, so we, we had an initial budget for that, um, grants being uplifted. We do have to put some of our own uh, HRA funding in to match that uh, to get these acquisitions, but in the, in the end, it adds to our pot funding for stock increase, and these homes eventually will enter the general um, social housing stock. Um, then on new build housing, um, we've got the move on provision at Fraser Road. Now, costs have increased on this by a, a further 265 Okay. Um, originally this was envisaged to be at around a million, it's now going to be 1.7 million to deliver six um, units of temporary accommodation. Um, it's been driven by timescales from the funder, uh, which we've got additional funding from Homes England. Um, so it, while it has drawn in some funding, I think it, these costs have been clear at the start. It's not something we'd have progressed with, they wouldn't have met the value for money criteria, but we are, we're, where we are because we were driven down a, a route of uh, modern methods of construction, um, moving quickly in order to meet funders' deadlines to access the funding. Um, so, and also we are, there, is a, there is additional funding going in to move these to a net zero carbon. So these will be net zero carbon operational houses, but again, that comes with uh, additional costs. Um, so it was just to make clear that point, while that budget's increasing, it's, um, it's been a difficult uh, decision to move on that one. Um, Waterthorpe School Roof, we've uh, identified a saving on that. There had been inflated costs gone into the original outline business case. So actually, we've identified approximately 600K that we can put back into uh, investing into education estate, which is good news. And then finally, we've got um, a low carbon grant um, to small medium enterprises. So we're getting funding from combined authority um, to issue grants to small businesses to allow them to implement um, carbon saving measures such as uh, you know, uh, solar panels, double blazing, etc., um, and that's something that we're operating uh, on behalf of the uh, city region. Sorry, quick, Mr. Top there. Thank you. I must apologise. Uh, so I'm just going to stop uh, before I take questions for um, Damien. Um, item number eight. I forgot to ask if we were all agreed with the recommendations. All right. Have you agreed? Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so questions for Damien now. Damien, my question is around that moving on provision on Fraser Road, and I did have questions about how much it's gone up. Could you just tell me how much of the costs have been about making the properties net zero? I think we've got a colleague who might be able to uh, help me with that <laughs> today. A colleague from Capital Delivery Service who's, who's worked more closely on design, etc. So okay, no worries. Because it's is it six, isn't it? Is it six units? Six yes, six, 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 six units. Yes. Hi. Um, in terms of net zero contributions, we've um, secured additional funding through the net zero grant funding. Um, it is approximately twenty five thousand pounds per property from a net zero um, calculation. Five thousand. Twenty five thousand. Twenty five. Okay. So that, that makes up part of the increase, but clearly there's other issues. So the question I had was actually whether we need to really look at our contingency strategy here and to say how on earth this has gone up so much would be the question I was going to ask you. Whether 
you know, we've had a contingency, it's gone over that as well. So it's not just that it's gone over the original budget, it's the original budget with a contingency, I think it was about 100k, was it, Damien or something? Hang on, on here somewhere. And then it's gone up even more, and that's quite worrying for me. That if it was because you wanted to make the building future proof net zero, I would be a little bit more relaxed. That it's only 25 per property, that's 150k, and you've got 260 here, so there's another 100k. Yeah, the, the, the increase is mainly due to inflation and the construction pressures uh, in the market. So when this was priced, it was um, last year, effectively before the large increases in, in April, uh, with the ABC went into this scheme. And it's significantly increased since then, um, from our infrastructure costs and increased leasing across the board, unfortunately. I think the worry here, Chair, is it's going back to the previous comment about, you know, we're going back to the HRA to help us cover this. And that's not a great strategy, given that we've got other pressures on HRA, i.e. 12 million of funding that we thought we'd have in our budget for capital. That's not coming from the HRA. And then we're pulling here on the capital as well. It just just makes future investments and issues around you know building more council homes or making them with better roofs more challenging but it's not really a question that is it's more of a comment but thank you for your information for me and thank you for clarifying thank you councillor shafak if there is there any further questions or comments damien did you want to say anything your mic Okay. okay, so this report does contain recommendations for approval. Um, are we all agreed? Yep, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number 10, and that's page 185 of the agenda, and Jessica is going to present that, and that's the Simca Food Poverty Funding Allocation. Thank you. Um, so, the um, South Yorkshire Mayor Combined Authority are making 150,000 available to Sheffield City Council uh, with the stipulation that it is to be used for sustainable initiatives to alleviate food poverty. So, this report outlines uh, the proposals for how that funding will be utilised. The propo um, this one off funding, there's no clawback provisions, and the only stipulation that it is for sustainable food poverty initiatives. Um, so the two schemes that are proposed in the uh, report are in line with the Council's existing food action plan that was approved last year at the Strategy and Resources Committee. The first scheme is to invest in um, collaborative food purchasing infrastructure, uh, and that will be via S6 Food Bank. Over the last uh, six months, the Council has invested in a food store at S6 Food Bank, which has enabled them to buy food on behalf of other food banks in the city. We're not allowed to use the SIMCA funding in this way because that wouldn't be a sustainable use of the funding. But what we can invest in is the infrastructure that goes around that food purchasing. So the delivery, the time it, it, it takes to, um, to, put, to procure that food, which will make the, the wider food bank network more resilient uh, and able to access that food in a more cost effective and resource efficient manner. The second initiative is to invest in food works who are an organized a social enterprise in the city who um, source and redistribute surplus food, will invest in them to increase their uh, infrastructure and surplus food sourcing, which will enable them to establish a number of affordable food clubs around the city. So currently they've got one of these set up in Handsworth. Uh, they will work in partnership with community organizations in areas of, with high levels of poverty to set up a number of additional initiatives, which will have a financially sustainable model. Um, so the one-off investment should give us something that will um, have a lasting legacy. Um, the schemes that are proposed have been developed following consultations with the Food Ladders Network, which is a, a network of food banks and other types of food relief initiatives in the city. So we have, um, we've had kind of broad sign up from across the sector. Uh, and the recommendation is that Finance Committee agrees to the proposed funding allocations. Thank you very much for that, Jessica. Um, any questions or comment, Councillor Shafford? I mean, just a comment rather than a question. I mean, I welcome any funding. I mean, I, I'm sure you've been there as well, Chair. Woodworks at Handsworth, we went to visit. I think I got quite a few cross party, was it? I think it was. Uh, Council Lodge went, um, I remember, and a number of us went to Woodworks, and they were 
pretty clear that they wanted to expand out. So if we were able to help them buy this money, then I wish them well. And clearly, as someone who's worked in supermarkets and food before, economies of scale really matter here. And the fact that S6 will now be able to, well, once the purchase, and it has been from other for other smaller food banks will mean that you know you get more bang for your buook. So yeah, absolutely support both proposals, Chair, and wish you well. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Shafak. Any further questions or comments? Councillor Elliot? Thank, thanks for your work on this. Um, I was just going to ask about, so where you've said that um, obviously to meet the funding provisions around sustainability, um, you've come up with this model, and I'm really glad that you've discounted the bread and butter thing, um, because I think obviously using local providers rather than national is better for multiple reasons. Where you've got some smaller food banks that don't fall within the umbrella of S6, um, it says that you will help them to apply for future grant funding. Can you just tell me a bit more about that? So if someone approaches me as a local councillor and says, you know, we've got a smaller food bank, um, how can I tell them to sort of get in touch with you to help them? Yeah, it's not, it's not exactly that. So in order to take part in the collaborative food sourcing, there is no requirement to join the S6 network of food banks, which if anyone isn't familiar, they're a large network of food banks in the city. It's absolutely not the aim of this to get everyone to join S6. We think we've got a diverse range of food provision in the city. We want it to stay that way and that people want to be independent for a reason. So this is enabling them to tap into the the infrastructure and the expertise that S6 have got about that bulk food purchasing without having to necessarily join the Trussell Trust or the S6 network. It's purely a transactional arrangement with the food purchasing. Um, it doesn't, none of the other things would apply. Uh, the additional, um, the initial grant funding is some funding, I think it's been made available by the ICB, I, I believe, which is, um, I'd have to get some more information about the, the conditions of the grant, but they wanted to make some funding available to the cost of living. Um, effort and food poverty and uh, last year there was the um, fund that South Yorkshire Funding Bureau I believe made available to food banks to apply for which they could use for on cost and food purchasing so it's likely to be a repeat of that which was vastly oversubscribed last time round so um, there'll be a similar call um, for organisations to ask for money out of that pot which they could use to buy food or pay utilities for example. Councillor Chapman. Yeah, I do actually volunteer at the food bank S20 and we do actually approach Hillsborough occasionally to stock up. It's a case of if you're part of a food bank, you can apply to get some food from there. You can't pick and choose. You have to have what they've got in stock. So we might end up with a mountain of Frosties or a mountain of uh, whatever porridge but you get what's there. And then we buy the rest of the stuff from the money that we acquire through Morrisons and grants and other things. So it's, it's a resource and they're there to help boost what you can actually do yourself. Really. And it's a really good thing, but we actually, we have to borrow a van from the living centre at Bing and go and collect it ourselves when we get that. Right. Thank you. If there any further questions or comments, um, the report does contain recommendations for approval. Can I ask, are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's unanimous. Moving on to the final item, which is item 11. Minutes of the Finance Urgency Subcommittee, page 199 of the agenda. Um, these minutes for the meeting are for noting. Thank you, thank you very much, and that's it for today's meeting. Thank you very much.